Can you feel it? Can you feel the electricity? It's very palpable in the air right now. Biggest games of the college football season. Let's just go. Ohio State at Oregon is that big day. October 12th is one of the five most popular wedding dates of the season, which just is, again, evidence that evil exists in our society. Couldn't be us, though. Couldn't most of us. Couldn't be most of us. October 12th, Ohio State at Oregon. Here's what I get to see. I get to see Ohio State in really their first big, big game of the year. I get to see this as a Big Ten game. It's a conference game. I get to watch Dylan Gabriel face the best defense he'll probably face all year. Maybe the best defense he's faced in his entire career. And I get to see how good he is. In other words, is he a quarterback that can win those kinds of big games? Is Oregon the kind of team that can do that? Or put the shoe on the other foot. Is Ohio State with Will Howard, recently named starting quarterback there, at least officially. Is that the kind of team that can go on the road in this kind of environment? I mean, picture Will Howard, third and seven, Autzen Stadium at full throat. Picture the uniforms if you don't even know the names of the teams. Remember last year when Dan Lanning and Oregon played in that Pac-12 championship game and certain people, me, not just me, but me, were very confident that Oregon would be the more physical team, that Oregon would handle the ground game and they would be able to dictate terms on the ground, and neither one of those ended up being true. Is Ohio State able to go up there and silence that crowd by running the football down Oregon's throat? That's certainly something they've worked an entire offseason to make sure never happens again. That's a game I'm excited for. Georgia at Bama got game of the year written all over it in the SEC, got one of the games of the year written all over it in the country. September 28th, we get this in the first month or so of the season, Saturday night in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Nick Saban and Alabama had a really good run against Kirby and Georgia. Georgia's got the whole uh, moniker of number one program in the country. I believe that to be true. Kirby Smart's got the moniker of Number one head coach in the country. I believe that to be true. They've had a Bama problem. So did that walk out the door when Nick Saban walked out the door? Because this right here will go a long way in foretelling what the rest of the season has in store for both of those teams. It's just the beauty of these sorts of games. Uh, Georgia will have a couple more like this. Bama will have a couple of more like this. But these have been the two premier brands in this conference for quite a while now. And I really don't care that Nick Saban left because He left a monster there for Kalen DeBoer to take over. Kirby has long since built a monster in Athens. So regardless of who the head coach is at Alabama this year, this is always going to be one of the circle games in this sport. And you know what it'll really come down to? Talk about all the coaches, but it'll really come down to the same test it came down to in Atlanta when they played last December. And that's Alabama owned it. Alabama's offensive line ended up owning the game enough up front to where they were able to win it. And just as sure as we're coming out of fall camp right now, one of the things they probably feel best about at Alabama is their offensive line and their ability to run the ball. And at Georgia, this is a team with very few weaknesses in uh, very first world terms, though. One of their questions there is, are we as a lead up front defensively as we've been in years past? It's a beautiful thing. Georgia at Bama, beautiful thing. Penn State at USC is a game I've got circled. Also, On October 12th, I'm listing all these big games of the year, like half of them are on October 12th. By this point in the year, USC has already gone to Michigan. I think that's week three or week four. And so we've already seen USC on the road get tested against one of the more physical teams in the country, which is, it's going to be the evergreen question about Lincoln Riley teams until he does something about it. And that is, These teams that are bigger and stronger than you up front, do they just put you on skates or can you do something about it? Well, they couldn't last year. Can they do something about it this year? Well, then I just watched Michigan win a national title. I've watched Michigan win the big games. I've seen Michigan beat Ohio State three consecutive years. I hadn't seen Penn State do that lately. Uh, Now, we are a far cry on this show from calling Penn State overrated or James Franklin overrated. That's some of the dumbest talk that happens in college football right now. In fact, that's how you can tell who really understands what they're watching in this sport versus who just wants to hear themselves talk because James Franklin is very properly rated. Penn State's very properly rated, which begs the question on the afternoon slash evening of October 12th, who will be favored in this game by that time? Will Penn State be expected to win? Is this a game they go out there as a four-point favorite in and take care of business? 
Is it a game they're a field goal underdog in and take care of business? It's kind of a man-maker game for USC. They got a few of these things. They got the Michigan game. They got this one, Wisconsin. Those are the kinds of games where if you're not what you need to be, physically, it's, it's all due respect. It's a little bit different than playing Washington State in Pac-12 play because these are folks who have a different caliber of athlete, O-line, D-line, and they can really humble you and embarrass you. Now, the second part to that is USC's got one of the better wide receiver cores in the country. They got potential to have one of the best passing attacks in the country. I was over on the Peristyle today, which is our USC message board, and someone called Lincoln Riley a walking top 10 offense. Pretty good way to put him. So Penn State, we've been talking a lot about them losing those corners to the draft and backfilling them from the portal and maybe another guy that portaled in last year coming along and coming of age. Great test for Penn State secondary. So I'm looking forward to that. You know what else I'm looking forward to? One week before that game is October 5th. It's in Tallahassee, Florida. It's Clemson at FSU. Classic referendum game. Who doesn't love? Whomst amongst us wouldn't love a good referendum game. And the old referendum in the ACC is you got guys who are willing to use the transfer portal, and then you got guys who aren't so willing to lean into the transfer portal. I don't want to get specific. I don't want to name names, nor do I need to. Everyone knows who I'm talking about here. Uh, where is Clemson by the time this game's played? You may look at that and you may say, October 5th? What do you mean? That's pretty early in the season. That's true. Season's not even halfway over here. However, Clemson will have already played Georgia. They're about a two-touchdown underdog against Georgia. They will have already played App State. They will have already played NC State. Now, last year, by this time, Clemson already had multiple losses on their schedule en route to a 9-4 and four finish, but 4-4 four and four in ACC play. So where are they this time this year? And regardless of where they are, this one will have a lot of ramifications. Number one, because it's Clemson versus FSU. But number two, it's because of one way of doing things versus another way of doing things. And everyone's going to draw conclusions, as they kind of did last year. I mean, in reality, it was a nip and tuck game. I think I was at Notre Dame. I was out in the tailgate section at Notre Dame watching this game happen, if I'm not mistaken. And, I mean, it comes down to the wire, but it didn't matter. Margins of, of nano fractions of inches, and yet because FSU wins, Mike Norvell's 100% in the right, Dabo's 100% in the wrong. Right or wrong, that's the way people talk about this stuff. So we've got that going for us. We've got the conversation of who the best head coach in the ACC is going for us. And if you're interested in actual football, I get to see Florida State's offensive line versus Clemson's defensive line. And those are two of the best units, respectively, in the conference. Next up, these are in no order, obviously. Michigan at Ohio State, November 30th. Last game of the regular season, last week of the regular season. You know how sometimes they say you can throw out the records in rivalry games? Our buddies over at Solid Verbal have long since had a very, very snazzy sound effect that goes along with that phrase. And a lot of times that's not true. Because if you look at records in rivalry games, shockingly, the outcomes largely correlate with who the better team was that year, who the point spread favorite was. Of course, there are anecdotal exceptions to that rule. Everybody knows we can go find upsets. It's just that when an upset happens in a rivalry game, it gets more magnified than if an upset were to happen in Ohio State versus Purdue. Um, there are a lot fewer further between, but you get my point there. However, when I say records wouldn't matter here, very few people think Ohio State will be out of the playoff picture come Thanksgiving week. Everybody thinks they'll be in it. Some people think Michigan will be in it. Some people think Michigan will already be out of it. But whether Michigan is, uh, what would they be, 10-1, and one, or whether they're 7-4, and four, if we go into this one, Ohio State's favored by 17, whatever the case may be, the closer you get to kickoff, the closer your mind goes back to who you picked to win the last few years. And some of us, there are some amongst us who picked Ohio State to win maybe two out of the last three years, maybe three out of the last three years. And so you start thinking to yourself, well, yeah, this year seems like a slam dunk for Ohio State. Yeah, everything seems to be lining up for them. But, man, I felt confident the last few years, too and it didn't go my way. And then, if there's a turnover early, 
if Ohio State plays a little tight because they got more on the line in terms of the future, um, the record doesn't really matter all that much. It's the beauty of being able to talk in this game. As long as you're going to play a football game, you talk all you want to. What about Georgia at Texas, October 19th? Steve Sarkeesian versus Kirby Smart is one of the best matchups in the country this year. Now, they're not on the football field, but uh, their respective styles, offensively, defensively, that is a wonderful thing to watch in terms of matchup. If you don't know a thing about this sport, in fact, if you're trying to recruit someone, if you've got a loved one, a spouse, a significant other, a wayward cousin that you're trying to bring back in the fold, and you're trying to recruit them to this wonderful sport of ours, just have them watch this. This is Georgia in, in Daryl K. Royal Stadium. They don't need to know anything else. They're watching the highest level of athleticism this sport has to offer. It is a classic uniform game. The environment will be off the charts. Austin will be grade A bonkers because they also have an F1 race in town that weekend. And it's also a defining game for both of these teams' seasons. Keep in mind, Texas' schedule is fairly favorable, as favorable as it can be in the SEC. Georgia's got a ton, um, you know, as much as you can have in a 12-game season, a ton of road tests, or at least tests away from Athens. This is one of them. Guess where we're going now? We're going right back to October 12th. Voila, Ole Miss at LSU, October 12th. I think you could argue this is Lane Kiffin's biggest test of the year. These teams, these programs know each other very well. No love lost here. But also, if you think about what the task is at hand for Ole Miss this year, most people would call them a failure if they don't make the playoff. I would, too. If you look at their toughest games, this is one of them. They got Georgia at home later in the year. You got to figure, if they split those games and take care of business elsewhere, they're a shoe-in for the playoff. Now, they may be able to backdoor their way in even if they lose both of them, but they're a shoe-in if they split one of them. Well, you win this one, and all of a sudden you find out how much wiggle room you have later in the season because, yes, kids, that's a conversation we have now in college football. The other thing is, as we talked about the other night, there is a very, very big buy advantage here for LSU. LSU is off the week before, and they play this game at home. This will be Ole Miss's either sixth or seventh consecutive game. So for a game of the year, normally you don't have that. Normally they're able to structure these bye weeks. Like when LSU and Bama play, they're both off the week before. Well, that is not the case here. This also, like I said, it just it determines how big games down the road are. Now that's the case for LSU as well, but it's really the case for Ole Miss. What about two weeks later, October 26th, we got FSU in Miami. Now, there are big games for both before this happens. But it feels much bigger than it has in years past. To me, it feels that way. Uh, now, if you're 44 years old, you can tell the younger ones what it was like growing up in an era where this was appointment television every year. When the helmet grid schedule came out, when you picked up the little magnet at your local grocery store and put it on the fridge, when the preview magazines came out and whatnot, one of the first things you did, I don't care if you're Canes or Knowles or Wyoming Cowboys, if you love the sport as a whole, you went and found out when FSU and Miami were playing, and you circled it. You made sure you didn't have anything else to do that day. Hadn't been that way for a while. When's the last time you, as an agnostic fan of these two fan bases, made it a point to watch FSU Miami? I think you'll make it a point to this year. The best roster in the ACC is who? Some would say FSU, some would say Clemson, because that's been the answer for a while. Some would say Miami. I think you may very well be looking at the two best here, not by a wide margin, uh, because Clemson has not taken a back seat to anyone athletically necessarily, but it's gone from Clemson and then the rest of the pack to, at the very least, you got a couple of challengers, and these may be the best here. And it's, again, I want to emphasize this. It is a premier rivalry in this sport. Just because they don't play it the last week of the year does not mean it's not a premier rivalry. It's just that as we've seen with Bama, Tennessee, which I'm about to talk about in 10 seconds, as we saw with that, 
when one team, or in this case, when both teams don't live up to the standard for quite a while, then all of a sudden you've got a generation that has to be taught why a premier rivalry is called a premier rivalry. Hopefully we get that back. Speaking of the third Saturday in October, Bama at Tennessee, October, let's see, that says October 19. Is that right, Belchie? I had it later in the year for some reason. I had November 16th. Probably so because it's called the third Saturday in November. Uh, third Saturday in October, my bad. So I may have it written down wrong. Either way, Bama, Tennessee is one of my favorite rivalries in college football. I grew up in the South, so I grew up being taught about this. Remember a couple of years ago, last time they played this game in Neyland, it was historic. It was like a postcard for the Tennessee program. And then last year, Tennessee got beat. Competitive game, Tennessee gets beat down in Tuscaloosa. This one, with where it falls in the schedule. Colin, do you have Tennessee's schedule in there, by the way, by any chance? A little bit later in the year. Uh, Bama's got tough games as well. But if you start thinking about the difference between 10-2 and two and 9-3 and three in the SEC, you start looking at games like this. You start looking at the fact that Tennessee, they got NC State, tough game but a neutral site. They go to Oklahoma in week four, and then they've got a game at Georgia later in the year. But outside of that, they get Florida at home. They get Bama at home. This is the year where they get both of them at home. I can't promise you the kickoff time that day, but I can promise you it'll have a bright red Sharpie circled around it. That's one of, against one of the premier games in the sport. It disappeared for a little while for non-Bama and Tennessee fans, but it reemerged two years ago. I think it'll have that kind of dressing around it this year because I think both these teams will be in the hunt this year. And lastly, but certainly not least, OU versus Texas is also Saturday, October 12th. What game isn't this time of year or this year? The payoff is worth all the talk to me. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about how Texas and Oklahoma are entering the SEC and who enters with a better shot and who's the better program. The edge in that conversation has been mostly Texas, and the vibe out of Oklahoma is, yeah, okay, whatever. Are we playing the game this year? Yeah, we're playing the game. Okay, well, we, really, we really don't care what anyone says, which is like the forever attitude in Norman about Texas because Texas will always get more coverage and Texas will always get more blind love thrown their way than Oklahoma will. As long as they play the game, then it doesn't really matter. And I've been at two of the last three in this series. Who knows where we'll be that Saturday? It's going to be one of the toughest decisions ever. But they're moving that one to 3.30. They did not get my approval on that. You know I love the 11 a.m. kickoff central time. But 2.30 central, 3.30 eastern is the kickoff this year. Nevertheless, my favorite game in college football is this one, at least of the ones I've been to. And I am not a neutral site guy, but this is the exception, one of the very few exceptions to the rule. There is, pound for pound, my estimation, not a better environment in college football than the Red River Shootout, known by no other name on this program. So those are 10 of the games I'm looking the most forward to this year. I left out like 15 or 20 more. You're all going to make arguments, and I'm not going to argue with you because you're going to be right because there are more than 10 good games. I just whittled it down to that because... Well, we were like 20 minutes to showtime, and I needed to get up here to the studio.